11 passages from the King James Bible that prove faith and works in the time of Jacob's trouble. Not today, in the time of Jacob's trouble. I'll say it one more time, not for today. Nobody is saved by faith and works today, but they were in the past and they will be in the time of Jacob's trouble. And I'm gonna show you 11 passages that are irrefutable that prove this, okay? There's a whole movement going around right now called uh, sola fide or whatever else, a faith alone people and things. Uh, that term doesn't appear anywhere in scripture. Nowhere does the Bible say faith and alone beside each other. Um, in fact, the only place where it says faith alone in the same verse, it actually is condemning faith alone. <laughs> um, it's kind of funny. We'll get into that verse later. But uh, this, this whole movement comes from Reformed theology, Catholics that left the Catholic Church and created their own form of Catholicism. And they say, we have the five solas. And I'll go over three of them. Faith alone, uh, grace alone, and, and the word alone, you know, scripture alone. Sola scriptura, sola grace, gratia, sola fide. Isn't that impressive? And um, the funniest thing is the Bible never says grace alone. The Bible never says faith alone. And yet they'll say the scripture alone is our authority. Uh, what does that mean? Well, class, usually when you see things that uh, are not true, that usually makes the person that says them a liar. Can we all agree to that class? They're liars. Faith alone and grace alone are not in the Bible. Okay, let me just explain it one more time. Faith is man's attitude towards God, believing things that you can't see. Grace is what God does for man. God doesn't have to have faith in you. You need to have faith in God. And if you have grace for God, it means nothing. Okay? Grace is what God does. Faith is what man does. So if you say, if you say I am saved by faith alone, salvation has always been by faith alone, then you're saying that you are the author and finisher of your salvation. It's that simple. Okay? <laughs> but see, here's the whole thing. And here's what you got to come away with from this whole study. Why well, I'm angry and everything else. A little sarcastic here. I know it's just, it just hurts so bad, doesn't it? You know, whatever. Um, the reason I'm angry is these people are working very hard to try and change what the Bible plainly teaches to get people into the time of Jacob's trouble saying, I can take the mark of the beast because I am saved by faith alone. I can go ahead and do whatever I want to do in life because I am saved by faith alone. No works are connected. And I'm going to show you that that is a flat out lie. I mean, a, a small child that understands the basics of Scripture can look at the Old Testament and say, hey, you know what? They were sacrificing animals back there to make an atonement for the soul. Hmm. The New Testament comes along and they're not doing it anymore. Uh, and back in the Old Testament... Jesus isn't there. He didn't die on the cross in terms of, you know, being there in his death, burial, and resurrection. It's not there in the Old Testament, but it's over here in my New Testament. I know that's so difficult to get, but, you know, these people just come and they give all these little philosophical arguments to try and mess your head up. And it's all to prepare people for the time of Jacob's trouble, falsely called the Great Tribulation. Time of Jacob's trouble comes along. Take the mark. It's okay because you're saved by faith alone. People have always been saved by faith alone. There's no works involved. How dare you think that your works could mean anything? Let me show you what the Bible teaches. 11 passages that prove faith and works in the time of Jacob's trouble. Not today. One more time. In the time of Jacob's trouble. Let's look at them. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Show you the first one. And I'm going to tell you exactly also how that uh, these liars and these fakers will, will weasel around these passages. Because I've been dealing with these people for so many years now. I know exactly what they think. Not a big surprise to me. Matthew chapter 24, verses 13 through 16. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Their salvation is not now. They have to endure to the end to be saved. They say, and here's what they'll do. They'll say, well, that's physical salvation. It's physical salvation. It just means that you have to make it the whole way through the Great Tribulation in order to be saved, save your life. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. 
You say, well, it doesn't say that it's the gospel either. It doesn't say it's eternal salvation. Look at the context. What's the next verse say? And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. It talks about the gospel. Yes, it is talking about eternal salvation in Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. Yes, it is. Verse 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Um, Christian, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Antichrist isn't standing in my body, or nor will he ever stand in my body. Or if you're saved, he's not going to stand in your body. The holy place is the temple that's rebuilt in Jerusalem, part of the covenant that's confirmed between the Catholics and the Jews, Daniel chapter 9. All right? I mean, you study it out. I know it doesn't say Catholics and Jews in Daniel 9. I get that. But if you study out what's going on with a lot of the treaties and things and the, what's going on there with the Temple Mount and the fact that it's Fort Antonia, the Roman fort over there in Jerusalem, that the Jews are over there doing their bowing their head to the, to the Roman fort and whatever else because they're denying the words of Jesus when he said no stone will be all, you know, left on another. You know? Um, you know, they're denying the words of Jesus. Hmm. But let's continue here. Verse 16, that, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let them which be in Judea? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What are Christians doing in Judea? See, we're dealing with a different gospel here. Hmm. Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 through 51 who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord will, when he cometh, shall find so doing. That sounds like works to me. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming. My Lord delayeth his coming. Not, oh God, I, I don't really know him, you know. My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant, it's not just the guy making a profession, no, the Lord of that servant, get a hold of that, shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You mean that God would send his servant? To hell? Yeah, if they're not looking for him towards the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. Faith and works. But Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9. What about that? Right there. Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9 is written for a Christian. Okay? doesn't apply to somebody in the time of Jacob's trouble. You're not saved by grace through faith and not of yourselves, not of works. That doesn't apply to you in the time of Jacob's trouble. Well, I believe it does. Well, then you can go to hell. Okay? Just that simple. Because you're believing a false gospel. You're believing this faith alone stuff. If you're trying to say that it's, it's there, somebody can take the mark of the beast and they can still have grace through faith and whatever. Uh-uh. No. We'll get to that later. Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And the, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. They didn't go out to marry him, by the way. I'd like to point that out, because Jesus is getting married to a chaste virgin. Just one. Okay? Not, you know, virgins, plural. They went out to meet him, in other words. Like I said... And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. You mean you got to go buy something? Buy oil? Which, by the way, is not ever mentioned by Paul. Paul writing to Christians, born-again Christians, Gentiles and Jews, all in one body, and he never mentions oil. But these people have to go out and buy the oil. And many people say that the oil is likened unto the Holy Spirit of God. How do you buy the Holy Spirit? You have to work 
to be able to buy things, don't you? Faith and works in the time of Jacob's trouble. Verse 10, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they were that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Jesus says, I am the door. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. They're saying, Lord. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know uh, neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. You mean you have to watch? Yeah, it's work. You can lose your salvation in that time. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. And before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And He shall set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick? Or in prison and came unto thee. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Oh, don't worry about it. You're saved by grace through faith. Oh, no, it doesn't say that. Oh, don't worry about it. Faith alone. The gospel has always been by faith alone, dear friend. It doesn't say that. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. You mean to tell me he would, work, he would judge them solely on their works? How do you get faith alone out of that? It's not there. Verse 41, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For you had no faith. That's why you go to hell. Period. Let's go on to the next. Oh, it doesn't say that. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in, naked, and ye clothed me not, sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. They go to hell. Why? Because they didn't work. Don't have to do it today, but they'll have to do it in the time of Jacob's trouble. Hebrews chapter 3. Write these down. Okay? Matthew chapter 24, verses 13 through 16. Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 through 51. Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. Hebrews is the one we're on now. Chapter 3, beginning in verse 4. I'll show you another one. It's faith and works in the time of Jacob's trouble. Hebrews chapter 3, beginning in verse 4. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if, conditional clause, if, we hold the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. He that it endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. You have to endure to the end. You have to hold the confidence steadfast unto the end. That's works. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Who's the book written to? Hebrews. Um, I'm a Gentile. Born again Gentile. Okay, uh, My fathers weren't there in the wilderness being tempted. Okay, um, The Jews were. This book is written to a future group where God makes a distinction between Jews and Gentiles again. Right now, we're all one in Christ Jesus, according to Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Future, there's a separation again. Writing to the Hebrews, in time when they have to endure the end to be saved. Verse 10, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, 
they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. You can depart from the living God in the future. But exhort one another daily while it is called the day, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if, conditional clause again, if we hold the beginning of our confidence uh, steadfast unto the end. I'm going to give you a million dollars if you give me $10 million first. So you, you got to pay up your million dollars. No, the conditional clause was you have to give me $10 million first. See, the first thing I said is, you know, uh, dependent on what I, you know, the, the little conditional clause there. You can't just say, hey, you know, I, you know, in this passage here, I have, you know, salvation, but we'll just ignore that if. It's faith and works, very plainly. Next, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. I think that would be saved people. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. In other words, you can't fall away. This passage says you can't. It's impossible. And it's so funny because you get charismaniac devils and they'll say, well, um, this right here proves that you can lose your salvation. And you say, well, then can you get it back? They say, well, of course you can get it back. I've gotten it back numerous times when I've lost my salvation. I lose it and I get it back and lose it and get it back. The passage doesn't say that. The passage says it's impossible to get it back once you lose it. Um, is there a time coming in the future when people that take the mark get God's wrath with no possible exceptions? Uh, yeah, we'll get to that later. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 through 29. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Written to a Christian? No. Have you sinned willfully after you received the knowledge of the truth? Yes. All Christians sin. Read Romans chapter 7. Paul sinned like crazy. Struggled with sin. Well, then it's Right here, according to this, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. What's it talking about? It's talking about the Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. Verse 27, But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Hmm. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Despised Moses' law? Why is it tying back to the Old Testament when people live by faith and works? Probably because it's written to people in the future that are living by faith and works. That might be a clue. <laughs> of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall be, he be thought worthy, who hath trodden under the foot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, look at that, past tense, an unholy thing, and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. Hmm. Somebody lost their salvation. Next we have uh, James chapter 2. Next book over, written to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, not to Christians. Well, that's your interpretation. Uh, well, it's because I can read plain English. James chapter 1, verse 1, to the 12 tribes which are scattered, scattered abroad. Greeting. If you can read English, you can understand it. The 12 tribes are not here right now, but they'll be coming back in the time of Jacob's trouble. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? By grace through faith, not of works. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. But then you read verse 10. They always leave off verse 10 where it says about God ordaining works that we should walk in them and things. They'll leave that off, which is interesting. But these faith alone heretics. Verse 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, Notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. There's your faith alone passage. Faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. That's the only time that the two words show up in a verse together. Interesting, actually condemning faith alone. 
Verse 18, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou, do, thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Oh, I believe in Jesus, and I believe in God, and I believe the Bible. Very good, so do the devils. Congratulations, you have a confession of a devil. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? What do you do with that? Well, we can show over there in, in the book of Romans where it says that Abraham was justified by faith. Well, then you have a contradiction if you're trying to say one and not the other. It's both. He was justified by faith and works. Faith and works in the time of Jacob's trouble. And by the end of the thing, when the mystery of God is finished, Revelation chapter 10, it just works. Hmm. And you go into the time of the, the thousand year reign of Christ on the earth. A lot of people call it the millennial kingdom. You go into that time, Jesus Christ is physically on the earth. How are you going to live by faith then? We're saved by faith alone. <laughs> right there, it's Jesus. He's over in Jerusalem. You don't need faith. You can see him. It's pure works at that point in time. It's common sense, people. Uh... Verse 22, Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Very true for the future. Okay, not true today. Grace through faith today. But in the future, faith and works. <clears throat> Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. To the twelve tribes, to the Jews when they come back. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> I believe that these seven churches are a lot of debate back and forth who the seven churches are or whatever else. I believe that it's just groups of people in the time of Jacob's trouble, quite frankly. A lot of people say it's, it's you know, church age and doctrine or whatever. Eh, eh. There's a lot of problems with that. Let me show you one of them. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. And under the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Be watchful. Hmm. Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 25. Be watchful. And strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy faith perfect before God. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, no, it, it doesn't say faith. It says, I have not found thy works. Works. W-O-R-K-S. Works. Perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Compare that to Matthew chapter 24. Last couple verses there. Matthew chapter 25. Compare it. Compare scripture with scripture. This isn't talking to Christians. I don't have to watch for Jesus and, and if he comes on me unawares and I'm going to lose my salvation or something. <clears throat> verse 4 thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments for they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy they have not defiled their garments huh we'll see about that as we get to Revelation chapter 7 he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment overcometh that's works but look at this one here's a beauty and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. You won't blot out his name from the book of life? I thought that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption, according to Ephesians chapter 1. Why would the Lord say, if you're watching, if you're walking with me, you're worthy and everything, and, and, and if you do these things, if you overcome, I won't blot out your name out of the book of life. Why would he write that to a born-again Christian? 
that's sealed until the day of redemption. He's not. You say, but it's, it's the church. We're in the church age, and it's one of the churches. Um, church age is a man-made term. Okay? I understand why you'd say church age. I get that. I get that. I'm a dispensationalist. I get it. I'm not a hyper-dispensationalist, like some people lie about me. I understand. But there's a problem with that. Church in your New Testament just simply means a called-out assembly. It's not some magical term that's only for the body of Christ and nobody else. You can be a called-out assembly in the time of Jacob's trouble. <clears throat> Let me show you the next one. Number 10. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 14. Okay, first of all, you have verses 4 down through verse 8, the 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. So there's a distinction between Jew and Gentile now, where Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 says that there is no distinction. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Well, how's that work? If it's all teaching the same doctrine, then how is it that Galatians, it's we're all one in Christ Jesus, and here it's all we're separate? Revelation 7. Because it's written to two different groups of people. Let me demonstrate. Verse 8. Uh, excuse me, verse 9. After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds, kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which were saved by faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone, by the word alone. And, uh, no, he doesn't say that. Sorry. These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes. That's work. Yeah, I got to go uh, wash my clothes. You say, well, that's not work. I'm just going to do it by faith. I'm going to look at my clothes there and in the, in the, wherever we're going to wash them there. I'm just going to look at them. So what are you doing? I'm washing them by faith. Hold on. They'll be done soon. The faith cycle's almost done. <laughs> uh, no, you have to work. You have to work to wash those robes, wash those clothes. Somebody washes their robes in the time of Jacob's trouble. They're working. <laughs> You'll get it someday, hopefully. Wash their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. I'm washed. Okay. I don't have to have robes that I wash in the blood of the Lamb. Finally, Revelation chapter 14. Here's the big one. This is why these faith alone heretics are trying so hard to get their system through. This is why they're trying so hard to say, you're justified by grace through faith and, and at any time throughout. Well, they don't even say grace through faith most times. They just say, by faith alone, by faith alone, by faith alone. They remove God's grace out of the equation. It's your faith that saves you. It's your profession. It's your belief, you see. That's what saves you. You're in because of that stuff. So in the future, people can take the mark of the beast as long as they have faith. <laughs> Bunch of devils. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 through 12. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. They say, well, see, it's the everlasting gospel. It's the one that's always been there. No, no, it's another one called the Everlasting Gospel. Okay. How do you know? Compare it to what's in the Pauline epistles. It's not the same thing. Let me show you. Verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Bye-bye, Vatican. Looking forward to that time. I'll be in heaven seeing this. If you're lost, you're going to be on earth. You know, might survive it, but uh, doubt it. Verse 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, 
The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The everlasting gospel has always been there. Oh, so the mark of the beast has always been there? You see how nutty the post-tribbers are? You see how nutty these non-dispensationalists are? It's the everlasting gospel. It's always been there. Uh, then the mark of the beast was always there too. <clears throat> Verse 11. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Okay. Um, would that be called enduring to the end? To not, you know, to go into that time and not take that mark? You can't buy or sell. You can't go to work. Uh, would that be considered works for salvation? Yeah, it would. And uh, just kind of further put the little stamp on it here. Verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. They're enduring to the end to be saved, in other words. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Two. Keep the commandments and the faith of Jesus. Two different things. But the faith alone heretic comes along and they say, no, it's faith alone. Salvation has always been by faith alone in every dispensation. Uh, I don't really know how to help people like that. Uh, just get away from them. Somebody says faith alone, you're dealing with somebody that does not believe this King James Bible. They're lost. They're a heretic. They're getting people ready to take the mark. Um, and just worship the beast in his image because they're saved by faith alone and there's no works involved. You can't add to God's righteousness. It goes against God's gracious goodness. You know, goodness gracious, it's God's righteousness or something like this. Uh, doesn't work. So there you have 11 passages that prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's faith and works in the time of Jacob's trouble. Again, one more time. It's faith and works in the time of Jacob's trouble. Trouble, the future, in other words, not today. Grace through faith today. Faith and works in the time of Jacob's trouble. There you go. If you can read that, it's kind of bright right now. If I can get it to focus on that. I don't even know if you can read that. There we go. Really doesn't want to focus too good on that. There they are. In case you couldn't read it, I'll just go over them one more time. Matthew 24, verses 13 through 16. Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 through 51. Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 4 through 14. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 29. Uh, James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 14. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. Eleven passages that clearly say faith. They don't say the words faith in works. James chapter 2 does, but they clearly show faith and works in the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, so when you get confronted with these faith alone people, you give them those scriptures and you say, you're a liar. Uh, I don't want anything to do with you. Get apart from me. You curse it. Um, just as simple as that. Your King James Bible is easy to understand. This is the greatest book that's ever been written. This is what you need. This is your final authority. Not me, not you, not your pastor or your other YouTube guy that you like. This is the standard right here. Never says faith alone. Never says grace alone. Okay? It shows faith and works in the time of Jacob's trouble and in the Old Testament. Right? That's, again, part of their little scam that they like to do. So um, be very careful. The deception is getting worse and worse out there. Um, you really, really need to watch out for these heretics out there that call themselves Christians. That's going to be it. Thank you for watching.